Hello YouTube, today my video will be on algae in the planted aquarium. On this issue, there are various sources of information. The first we can read about is in the scientific papers that are published on algae. However, most of them are inconclusive. They center mostly on studying natural lakes and rivers, and these are quite different from the enclosed environment of our tank. And also with uh, regards to either nutrient levels or plant mass, um, they is it's a bit of a mixed outcome as to what works to keep an algae-free environment. The next place that many people go for information is forums. However, uh, the advice can be quite random. Sometimes it's excellent, uh, often it's not. And they, they are rarely holistic solutions because everyone's tank is a bit different. I would suggest a different approach instead. Instead of uh, looking for information on algae, why not do the opposite? Study people who have tanks that are algae-free and study what variables they use and learn to copy those systems well. I find that while people often pay great attention to things such as nutrient dosing and light, um, they often overlook other aspects of tank management such as the plant selection as well as how people prune as well as how often they do water changes and other stuff. One system that is popular in Asia that we can find many examples for is the ADA system. And the ADA system is nice to study because it is a very standardized set of equipment in terms of lighting, tank dimensions, even filter in and out flows, as well as even the substrate and fertilization system uh, are, is prescribed. So almost every ADA system is, has those same variables and one can study them and see what are the outcomes. Some tanks are algae free, some are not. Um, but overall, it is a pretty good system. The main difference between this and the other common system, the EI methodology by Tomba, is that this is a lean dosing system. Nutrient levels in the water are very low. On, let's say, the nitrate and phosphate test kits, the values can be consistently zero. Um, we will talk more about this later. In contrast to the lean dosing style of ADA, we can study the other popular system, Tomba's EI, of uh, non-limiting nutrient levels in the tank where plant growth is faster and many people who run such tanks use higher lighting as well and yet despite the very different approach higher lighting, higher nutrient levels, faster growth versus uh, lean dosing in the water column both can have algae free outcomes therefore it is not only nutrient levels in the tank that determine algae but other variables matter as well let us start by examining fish only tanks and these are the most common type of tanks available in most pet shops they contain fish but no plants um, many of them, because of overcrowding and other issues, have high nutrient levels in the water due to fish waste and yet a lot of them are completely algae free and this is primarily because of the lack of light Light is the limiting factor in this case uh, So in low light tanks, even with relatively polluted water, the tanks can be quite clean of algae You can easily get green water and other types of algae blooming in such tanks if you add a strong light I conducted a set of experiments to test the rate at which algae spores bloom under different water parameters in tanks that have no plants. I used a set of bottles, some filled with just plain tap water, others are mixed with tap water as well as tank water and varied the bottle contents with various nutrient levels. So some of the bottles contain EI levels of nutrients, others are just uh, plain tap water while well, some of them have a dead leaf ad added in to simulate organic waste. This is lit by a single BML light, but it's quite strong. Even at the bottom of the tank, it's about 120 par. And the results are pretty interesting. Uh, firstly, the four bottles that look the cleanest on the top right, they all contain pure tap water. Uh, they, some of them may be EI nutrient levels, some of them have you know, a single dead leaf, but none of them are turned green. Uh, because they do not contain tank water. This shows that to get an active algae bloom, you need algae spores to start with. And the function of water changes is not only to remove organic waste or excess nutrients, but it also plays the very useful function of removing algae spores. And within the other bottles that contain tank water, um, those with EI levels, that means higher level of nutrients, do get significantly greener than those uh, with low nutrient levels. However, having unmeasurable nutrient levels, that means testing zero on nitrates and phosphate test kits, do not prevent the bottles from turning green. It took about 6 days to get this visual result um, from the start, and all the bottles were clear from the start. 
I repeated this experiment a couple of times and the results are quite consistent. The one with high levels of nutrients with pollutants such as dead leaves and fish food are always the greenest, followed by the ones with tank water mixed with plain tap water, undetectable uh, nu nutrient levels. They, do, they still turn green but less so. And the, in this experiment at least, the bottles with pure tap water did not uh, develop any visible algae within the time that it was tested. So most of uh, the water stayed clear in the about 8 to 9 days under the strong light. Of course our tanks are not bottles of water, uh, things are different. <coughs> Whether it's Tomba's tank or my tanks, many of us dose high level of nutrients and yet have perfectly algae free tanks. And this is not because we have so large a plant mass that at some point during the week the nutrients bottom out and hit zero. Uh, if we do a nutrient test at any point of time in the week, whether is it before water change or at the end of the week, uh, there are consistently high positive values for MPK. The difference in outcomes is due to plant mass. In a non-planted tank, light and water parameters determine the outcome of algae. In a fully planted tank, plant mass and the state of health of plants determine whether you get algae or not. We can examine the top of our plants in many tanks and this will be the plants that are closest to the light under the strongest lighting levels. At the tops of many of our tanks, it can be up to 400-500 par and yet the tips of our plants are completely clean. This is because a fast-growing plant mass uh, deters al algae spores from settling in. If we extrapolate this effect to the entire tank, um, then you have an algae-free tank if you think about it. If you have fast-growing stem plants, at every single corner of your tank, there will be no space for algae to find a home and your tank will be algae free. Plant mass therefore matters in a tank. The more area of the tank that is covered by plants, the less areas can algae make a home. However, if the plants are not growing well, and that means they are melting or deteriorating, then they become the reverse. They become algae magnets instead. Keeping a fully planted Dutch style tank algae free is easy in that sense as long as you know you have enough skill to keep the plants healthy and growing however for many of us um, that are into scaping with uh, hardscape materials uh, we will have large portions of the scape devoted to either rocks or sand and this will not count as fully planted scapes for many other people uh, they may have tanks with slow growing plants or they may do Iwagumi style tanks with only carpeting plants and these slow growing plants and carpeting plants um, they are either they are less competitive against algae they are more vulnerable as a whole and the more vulnerable a tank is to algae the more we can compare it as to functioning like a tank without plants to this end we can divide planted tanks on a spectrum at one end tanks that are very fully planted and on the other hand um, tanks that may have so much hardscape and sparse planting that they almost function like tanks with uh, no plants. And the strategies of managing algae in either one can be slightly different. I shall name them System 1 and System 2. In System 1 tanks, the main concern is keeping the large plant mass healthy. You should at least have a regular dosing regime. It doesn't matter if it's a rich dosing regime or a leaner dosing regime but it needs to be sufficient enough to feed the plants and let them grow constantly. Good O2 and CO2 levels help. The good CO2 levels help plants a lot as a whole because plants are 40% carbon by dry mass. Once you do not have adequate CO2, most plant growth will slow down. Most casual hobbyists ignore the oxygen component in the planted tank, thinking that plants can survive all the oxygen requirement in the tank. Mm, this is not entirely true. As most of the time, actually the, the tank is dark. Photosynthesis only happens about a third of the day if you're on your light for 8 hours. Having good O2 levels consistently uh, ensures a more stable tank environment as a whole. It's better for bacterial activity and it allows one to fine-tune CO2 to a higher point if necessary without asphyxiating livestock. Good O2 levels can be easily achieved by having su sufficient surface agitation and circulation of the top layers of the tank water with the lower layers. Lastly, have lights that are adjustable. Sometimes a small difference of 20% more or less light can make the difference in outcomes. 
in system 2 tanks, we do not have the luxury of having massive plant growth to deter algae. Instead, we need to manage light extremely well. For most of this style of tanks, uh, those with a lot of hardscape with sparser plants, most of the plants will not require a very high lighting level to survive, so keeping to low or medium levels of lighting work better. Lower plant load and slower growth rates also mean that we can dose the water in a more lean manner compared to EI levels. And I find that this gives less algae issues as a whole. It doesn't mean that we can't do this uh, this tank of this style of tank using EI dosing levels. Um, but for many EI tanks, what I observe is that um, they do not have any other form of algae, but they all have extremely green rocks. That means they have a very severe case of green dust algae compared to tanks with leaner dosing. For people that persistently cannot get rid of this issue, no matter how much you tweak your CO2 or other variables, you can consider switching to a lean dosing regime. How low is low? You know, how, how little can we feed the plants yet still get good enough growth rates? Um, the lean dosing, dosing regime is harder to implement as a whole as it takes more experience to gauge the levels that your plants need. Mm, we can balance this out by having a good substrate. So if we dose the water column less heavily, but the plants can still uh, take in nutrients through their roots. Um, this, we can also dose smaller amounts more regularly rather than uh, dosing a huge amount at once. One can actually still get good color while using less light and leaner dosing. However, I think I'll cover this in a separate video. The last point I want to talk about is that spotting problems early and solving them is critical because there is less plant mass to fight off pl uh, potential issues. If you're growing an Iwagumi, you know, there is just a HC carpet. That's all you're going to have. If it get mostly infested by BGA, and BGA reaches a critical mass, it is extremely difficult to remove it thereafter without resetting the entire tank. Both System 1 and System 2 have their vulnerabilities. For people doing System 2, it's less forgiving towards mistakes as there are fewer plants in the tank, and yet a high level of cleanliness is required to show off the rocks in the hardscape. For many Dutch style tanks doing System 1, people become over obsessed with the use of strong lights, uh, thinking that it will give them better coloration in their plants. And this is not always the case. Other issues will be like if the, the plants get too overcrowded and pruning is not done regularly, growth stops and then uh, algae invades. For newly set up tanks, the appearance of algae tends to follow a predictable timetable. For the first couple of weeks, regardless of your parameters, your tank will be quite clean. Uh, this doesn't mean that we can sit back to relax though. We should use this window to deal in our CO2 accurately, make sure that our plants are growing well. If you have a dosing regime, it should be started already. And regular water changes should be done to remove organic waste, ammonia, and any potential algae spores in the tank. Between the third and fifth weeks, uh, many tanks will experience a small algae bloom. How large it is depends on your exact tank parameters, but if you have planted densely from the start and your tank is relatively clean, the potential algae bloom can be very small actually. During this period, if you have already dealt in your growth parameters, it is important to not panic and switch things drastically. If the algae symptoms are very severe, you can consider adjusting the light, uh, doing more water changes, and often uh, algae is very severe only if your plants haven't uh, rooted well from the first couple of weeks, and one should consider whether changing out some of the plants would work better. We can also preemptively treat any algae that is present and introduce algae eaters at this point. Early treatment is good. It is important to not let certain types of algae gain critical mass, such as BBA or Cladophora. Um, they will be very tough to remove later on. If the situation is handled well, the tank will go into a stable growth mode. Um, this might take anywhere from 6 to 7 weeks to a couple of months uh, if the tank is slower. These are a couple of my tanks. Uh, at the algae bloom period during about the 6 to 7 week mark and these are the tanks uh, after 2 months after things have stabilized this is another one that I set up during March this year and I kept this one pretty stable so even during the algae window um, there is barely any visible algae and this is the tank today after the stabilized form after the tank has stabilized then it's pretty easy going maintenance from then on until the plants get extremely overcrowded and when things get too overcrowded uh, 
old growth can start to rot below the tips may be not healthy anymore and algae will again come in uh, so the key is to do regular maintenance do pruning and replanting and uh, restore the tank to a stage of constant growth. Trade and hair algae are pretty common in a newly set up tank. However, if your growth parameters are dealt in and your plants are growing well, this will go away by itself. So I wouldn't bother treating them with harsh chemicals. The same goes for diatoms. Um, a lot of people think that it's associated with silicates, but this is just not the case. Um, if you use soil or if you have silicates in your water supply, your tank will constantly have an abundant amount of silicates. Yet, most of our tanks, uh, after they are properly cycled, contain no diatoms whatsoever. It is more to do with overall tank cycling, uh, the biological maturity of the system as a whole, than with the presence or absence of silicates. The next two types of algae should be ones that you constantly treat or remove. Um, Blackbeard algae as well as Cladophora. It is easier to treat them once they appear, uh, rather than leave them to gain critical mass and making removal later on difficult. In very well balanced tanks, they do disappear by themselves, but it can take a longer, a much longer time to happen. Green spot algae has a very specific treatment. If the most of your tank is clean, but this is prevalent, try increasing your phosphate levels. Lastly, we have green dust algae. This is kind of the bane of the experienced acaris. Um, I see in many tanks where the plants are growing well, but nonetheless, either the glass or the rocks are constantly plagued by green dust. And there are, there are a couple of ways to go about it. If you do the tomba method, uh, introduce algae eaters, use bristanol placos, lower your light, and raise your CO2. So overall, raising the growth parameters of the tank but lowering the light. If this doesn't work, I would argue that um, one can consider changing your entire nutrient do dosing regime instead of doing the very elevated levels of EI. Um, perhaps try something like ADA system. I will elaborate more on the lean dosing regime approach in another video. With that, I conclude my video and leave you with these three main takeaway points. The best defense against algae is a large and healthy and aggressively growing plant mass in the tank. Light control is important. A little goes a long way, so do adjust your lights. And lastly, focus on tank cleanliness. Water changes to remove organic waste, constant pruning to prevent overcrowding, and removal of dead leaves uh, and dead and dying plants is important because those are algae magnets. With that, thank you for watching and good night.